reality in solid, uh, the electrons are free. Right? So the electrons are interacting together, and they're also interacting with the lattice, right? and particularly fluctuations in the lattice, phonons. It's a, an amazing fact, actually, that you can take all of those different interactions, so you think you've got an insoluble problem, right? You've got 10 to the 23 electrons all interacting together, and they're also interacting with a lattice, which is vibrating, and you think, oh my god, <laughs> I'll never solve this problem. But it turns out you can. And you can actually take all of those interactions with the fluctuating lattice and the electrons interacting with each other, boil them all down to uh, an effective mass of the electron. So you call that electron that's cloaked with this cloud of excitations a lambda quasi particle, because lambda uh, developed what's called Fermi liquid theory, uh, which describes exactly that. You have two electrons which repulse one another by Coulomb screen interaction. Nevertheless, now in hands, we have possibility to glue these electrons due to their interaction with lattice, or better to say, with lattice vibrations. Imagine that you have a lattice, not the dead lattice. It moves, it is alive. And the vibrations of lattice, they can be quantized. Physically, the propagation of phonon means polarization of the lattice. Lattice is charged. It has positive charge. So when you have some compression and depressions in the lattice, there is a redistribution of charge and the places where the positive charge is concentrated can attract electron. This is a physical origin of electron phonon interaction. So one electron generates phonon and continue its life. So P1, it is the initial momentum. And then P1 minus HK, it is the final momentum of the first electron. The second electron, P2, interacts with the phonon which was generated by the first one and will obtain its momentum K and will continue its life with P2 plus H bar K. So this is why it's a complex wave function and you cannot represent it with in mind the simple picture of pairs of electrons that flow individually not taking care too much of each other. That would be the wrong picture. It is true, however, that at each point of time there will always be pairs of electrons but they will exchange all the time. One pair gets dissociated and A goes with another partner and B goes with another partner and they do that, all of them, at the same time. One can write the corresponding matrix element for such interaction. It is possible to do using the perturbation theory, uh, some model Hamiltonian, and one can see that this interaction is non-zero. You calculate the corresponding amplitudes, you sum them, and you find this interaction has a negative sign. A matrix element for electron with momentum P, which generated phonon with momentum K, will be proportional, let's say at least, as minus H omega K, where omega K is the frequency of phonon, then H omega K square minus epsilon P minus epsilon P minus K, this is uh, these are electron energies in square. So let's analyze this formula. First of all, I see that it is negative only when, when this part, so this is a difference between the initial and final energies of electrons, this is a difference of energies, is, much, is less than phonon energy. The characteristic phonon energy can be assumed as h, omega the by, the by, uh, the by frequency, this is a characteristic energy for phonons. So, let's come back to our Fermi surface. We have a huge amount of electrons, this so large orange with momentum P Fermi, with energy epsilon Fermi, which is P Fermi square over 2m, 
and we see that only electrons near the Fermi surface, we, uh, which are working electrons, in the skin of this orange with the width of omega de Bayer, which is much less than Fermi energy, only they can be attracted by electron phonon exchange. Only these electrons, all other are out of our interest. Please pay attention, I told quasi-particles. So now I speak not in terms of real electrons, but quasi-particles near Fermi level. This is very important. Okay, in the case of a normal metal, then the electrons are, are occupy states up to the Fermi wave vector. And all of those states are occupied. Above the Fermi wave vector, uh, no states are occupied. A function of wave vector, then the states are occupied completely uh, up to uh, the Fermi wave vector. The situation in a, a superconductor, because of the pairing interaction, is different. And in fact, this, the occupied states form a distribution. So that there are some uh, occupied states above the Fermi energy, even at absolute zero. The BCS interaction causes the pairs to occupy states above the uh, Fermi energy, and this minimizes the total energy of the system. There's a fundamental difference, you see, between the, the case of a normal metal and a superconductor, and it's what gives the superconductor many of its characteristics. And this is why, this is why fundamentally, uh, the quasiparticles um, in the superconductor are different to the, to the excitations that you get in a normal metal. What does it mean? It means that for Bose gas, even ideal Bose gas, what happens? When you decrease temperature, chemical potential of Bose gas is negative. When you decrease temperature, it increases. So the behavior is something like this. The chemical potential as a function of temperature will increase, increase, increase. And at some non-zero temperature, T0, it will be equal to zero. Then, if we still believe that we have the gas with fixed number of particles, equation shows that chemical potential must be positive. But it cannot be positive because the positiveness of chemical potential means the divergence of thermodynamical values. So what system does? It says, I will sacrifice the number of particles. So now number of particles become a variable, not fixed value. If you decrease temperature below T0, the chemical potential remains zero, and more and more particles from excited states, they condense in ground state. Nothing happens at Tc, right, because it's a second order phase transition, right, so the, the pair amplitude is zero at Tc, right, this is uh, and the superfluid density is also zero, right? So it's something that gradually develops as you go below Tc, but there's nothing happens at all at Tc. In normal state, we have only normal electrons. If you are crossing critical temperature, a part of normal electrons, a superconducting phase appears. So there are also electrons bound in pairs, Cooper pairs. Close to the Tc, the uh, amount of superconducting electrons is, is high, but still there are some normal electrons. If you are going to zero temperature, all electrons should be paired and no quasi-particles uh, exist. So below Tc though, uh, we also talk about quasi-particles, but they're not the same right, as the ones above Tc. These are called people of quasi-particles, and what these are, are excitations from the BCS ground state. So the excitations, the, 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 the lowest energy excitations from that state, are, are these boogaloo block quasi-particles. What they are, are uh, coherent mixtures of electron hole states, but it's a state which obeys fermionic statistics. Right? So basically you can, you can draw a, a, a Fermi distribution and the, the, the population of those states will basically be governed by your Fermi Dirac distribution function. But you should also keep in back in mind they're not really electrons and they're not really lambda quasi particles either. Above Tc, in normal metal, the spectrum of quasi particles as a function of momentum was this one. You have the particle branch, antiparticle anti branch, and all happens near P Fermi. This is for temperatures 
above Tc. When I take into account the possibility of interaction of electrons minus p, p plus q, due to electron phonon interaction plus Coulomb interaction, so our effective interaction, we already discussed these graphs. Two electrons in the superconductor coming together and exchanged by one phonon and goes away. But this is a simplified picture. It is valid only in the lowest order of the perturbation theory with respect to the electron phonon. Actually, in the highest order of the perturbation theory, the process is much more complicated and two electrons coming together might exchange by phonons many times and finally they finish in the bound state which is known as the Cooper pair. So, taking into account in perturbation way summing all these diagrams, I see that in the quasi-particle spectrum of normal metal at temperatures near Tc appears the instability and the ground state of quasi-particles is reconstructed. The superconducting transition means the reconstruction of the spectrum of quasi-particle. The gap is opened in it. This gap delta is a function of temperature. It is zero at critical temperature and then it increases it increases delta as a function of temperature is such curve and it reaches its maximum delta zero at zero temperature. Barden, Cooper and Schwiefer, they found the expression for this delta is a form H omega d by the proportionality exponent minus one over density of electron states on the Fermi level and the model interaction constant. Very good. Now let's try to understand what are the physical consequences of this statement. First, one can write that Tc, which is proportional to delta, we found the formula for it. Okay, this formula is not very good. Why? It means that actually BCS theory cannot say, look, take this material and critical temperature, this will be this on that. Why? Because this temperature dependence on parameters of our electron system is exponential. So small mistake in the effective constant will result in strong mistake in Tc. So we can say that this theory is not very good to predict, not very predictable for critical temperature. People started to empirically look for new superconductors with high critical temperature and high critical magnetic field.